Hey guys, the video you're watching right now is a production from The Radio. You'll notice uh, uh, myself, Michael Roundtree, and Michael Miller are not the co-host of this program on Tuesdays. On Tuesdays, we are covering church history. Here on Remnant Radio, we want to cover theology, church history, and the gifts of the Spirit. But none of us are patristic scholars, but we know some. Uh, in fact, the scholars that we interview frequently on church history, we have empowered to make weekly content here on Remnant Radio. So for the next 12 weeks, Josh Hoffert, Father Ron Drummond, and Matthew Escobar are going to be your guides through the early church fathers as they tackle this patristic period of history uh, that we are calling Back to the Fathers. And uh, speaking of Father Ron Drummond, he wears that clerical collar he every does. single week. And I think he needs something new. Yeah. We are he entirely crowdfunded. And if you donate to the Remnant Radio, perhaps we could afford to Another provide shirt. Father Ron Drummond with a new shirt. Solid. So uh, that is speaking of us being a crowdfunded ministry. We are. I want to invite you to uh, to contribute. If you've benefited in any way from Remnant Radio's content, uh, two ways that you can do that. You can click on the link for PayPal or Patreon. PayPal is for a one-time donation. Patreon is for a recurring donation once a month for as little as $5 a month. And we provide you with exclusive content that Josh and I come up with as well as uh, some of our other contributors. So I want to invite you guys to do that. Consider donating. And now stay tuned for Back to the Fathers. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Back to the Fathers. Episode two, Back to the Fathers, is a new show on Remnant Radio uh, where we look to the great figures of the ancient church in order to help inform and inspire the life of the church today. We ask questions like, how did the early church fathers do theology? How did they handle theological controversies and conflicts? What was their view of living life in the spirit, living life as a disciple of Jesus Christ? Uh, my name is Father Ron Drummond, and I'm one of your co-hosts, uh, along with my illustrious and learned brothers in Christ, Joshua Hoffert and Matthew Esquivel. <laughs> Uh, as you can see, they are wearing different shirts than they were last week. I, however, am wearing the exact same shirt as I was before. Hey, if you like the content we're providing, uh, make sure you like and subscribe. And uh, with that, I'm excited to get this episode kicked off. So, uh, Matthew, why don't you tell us what we're going to be talking about today? All right, Matthew Esquivel here, everybody. I think we're going to have a great episode today. We're going to be talking about how the early church tested and evaluated prophecy. And um, this is just a great opportunity for us to, as Father Ron talked about, to not only learn what they did just for the sake of history, which I love history, I'll read a history book just for the sake of reading it, but also um, just think about how that might inf inspire and inform the church today. So um, Joshua Hoffert here, our good friend, who's just done a lot of studies on the Desert Fathers, a lot of early church figures, and, um, and some of these early texts that specifically deal with how prophecy and prophetic people are evaluated, um, he's going to give us a lot of insight into that. So Josh Hoffert, tell us a little bit about these texts and uh, what we're, what we're going to gain from them today. Well, I, I think the first thing that we need to address is whether or not uh, Ron is under bylaw from his holy orders to wear the same shirt every time or not. Oh you goodness. know, that's the question I have. <laughs> yeah, is, is, this, is this, is this, you know, you know and, I'm envious. <laughs> I'm thinking of just picking a shirt out of my closet and wearing yeah, yeah, yeah. it every time. Maybe this one, if you know, if I get enough likes <laughs> on it, like if you like this shirt and I'll wear it again next week. Um, if, I get, if I get at least a hundred. Um. <laughs> well, and I guess the question from there, given our, our modern contemporary society is, uh, is it mandated or is it a law that's put in place? And what's the difference between a mandate and a law? So, uh, you know, no political commentary oh my goodness. here. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Sorry about that. And <laughs> objections and conscientious objections yeah, and right. exemptions. Yeah, How do those right, apply? That's right. <laughs> Don't get me started. <laughs> yes. Oh, well, and, and talking with my Anglican brother friends up here, I know um, – that the, uh, the the process of instituting new law, whether it has to do with what shirt you have to wear or not, is a uh, a lengthy process. Things don't change very quickly in the Anglican Church, not at least at least uh, in Canada. Um, anyway, yes. So uh, sorry for the uh, I digress. I guess is what I should say. Um, today, our episode looking at how the early church. Uh, really how they approach prophecy and how they evaluated prophecy, and obviously that being a pertinent thing 
today we can call back to uh, an episode that the Remnant Radio did at the end of last year where they went through and evaluated a number of prophecies. Um, and, and, and so, you know, it's been on people's heart to, to try and well, how do we approach prophetic ministry today and how do we deal with uh, some of the inconsistencies and accurate inaccuracies we see um, and, and how, what are we to think about? And some people just, of course, want to say, well, that stuff is not for today and we should just throw it out. Um, and some people want to ignore some of the issues that have arisen in the last couple of years. And, and then people like myself want to look at, well, what did the early, is there anything we can learn principally from the early church and how they approached uh, the function of prophecy within the community? And, um, and can we reconstruct something that would work today? Just, well, just because the early church practiced right. it doesn't mean it was right. Right. Uh, and so when we say and, early church, Josh, if I can interrupt you for a moment, yep. we're, we're talking post-apostolic period, like post-biblical. Um, so we're, we're talking about texts that we have from late first century, second century, third and fourth centuries, and so forth. So we're going... We're going beyond that time period. Am I correct? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And mm-hmm. and that I mean, the first thing I think to say about that, and then as it relates to prophecy too, is the reason why we would even look because that's a question people have, right? Why would we even look at the early church fathers? What's the point? Don't we need? We just need scripture. And while I agree, scripture is our our guidepost for everything having to do with life, faith, uh, all these things. Um, how the early Christians practiced the things laid out specifically by Jesus and then the apostles uh, mm-hmm. can inform what we do today. And so if if Paul taught on the gift of prophecy, of course, in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, um, do we see that continually in operation moving into mm-hmm. the post-apostolic, uh, you know, where you get into the apostolic fathers um, like Ignatius of Antioch, like Barnabas, uh, like Irenaeus of Lyons, this kind of stuff, and then you get into the Latin Greek fathers. All this, right. do we see it? Do we see it continuing to happen? Do we see them documenting it? Do we see them talking about it? And mm-hmm. the emphatic answer with that is yes, we do see absolutely. an unbroken tradition. We absolutely see that. Yeah, uh, and, and so, uh, yeah. Well, I was just going to say, Go I, ahead. I think one of the real values, particularly in some of the documents that uh, Josh, you're going to be looking at today, is that they establish. Uh, this this link, because as Matthew said, we are going beyond uh, the New Testament, uh, but with some of these documents, we're not going that far beyond the New Testament. Right. And so that, uh, you know, some of these writings would be familiar to people who would have also been familiar at some point with actual apostles or disciples of the apostles right. or things right. like right. that. And so uh, the we as Christians today ask the question, how do we, uh, how do we interpret and appropriate the scriptures uh, for us? Well, we're hardly the only ones who have done that. And so the value in this is that we're looking at kind of the very first people who took these scriptures and said, okay, how do we live them uh, in our life as a church now? Right. So right. we have a historical testimony that the gifts of the Spirit continued after the apostles, which I think is just really significant to point out here. Yeah. Yeah, and, and very important, and we may get into mm-hmm. this near the end of the episode, where mm-hmm. you've by the time you reach the 6th century, you've got Gregory the Great in his homilies on um, his homilies on Ezekiel, the book of Ezekiel, he's got a, a, robust, a robust understanding of the, the individual exercise of prophecy uh, within a person, and so much so that he gives counsel towards the people he's teaching about when it would be proper to be expected to be used in prophetic ministry. Right. And we're, this is, this is Gregory the Great uh, died at about 604. Uh, I think it was 604. Um, and he was, the, you know, he was the leader of the church in Rome, so this basically puts him over all of the church um, mm-hmm. at, at that point. I mean, this, this is one of the heavyweight authors of his time. Right. But, uh, and he preached so, on Ezekiel. He has multiple homilies on one of the most bizarre books of the Old Testament. (laughs) One of my favorite ones, but uh, one of the ones I probably understand the least a lot of the time. So, (laughs) yeah, there you go. go. So, pastors today, I mean, just like, what are we doing? we got to, you know, we got to broaden broaden our our preaching (laughs) ground a little bit here. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. That's right. So his first three chapters are specifically, because he wants to understand the role of the prophet, and so his first three chapters are really pulling that apart and looking at biblical examples and how do we understand that. Um, and and then giving practical principles for people that would be expected to be used, um, 
And, and again, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but one of my favorite things that Gregory says is how, how do we know that we're ready to be used? And he says, when um, you're no longer elevated by praise or withered away by criticism. And that's, that's his test for when you're ready to be used in prophetic ministry. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, right. it's such a good statement and so practical to today. Uh, that's when, good. when you, yeah, when you're not moved by people's accolades, when you're not crushed by people's criticism, uh, you right. can start to see there may be some, some usefulness there. Right. So, yeah. Josh, the, something unique about that I know you're going to talk more about here is that within the, within the early church's post-apostolic period, we saw the gift of prophecy operating like in the daily liturgy and life of the church. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. In, um, you know, in the uh, Testament of the Lord... Uh, which is here. We're just going to throw a couple of these books up here. I learned to do this from Matthew Esquivel to have the books on hand. <laughs> you got to you got to do your book your book uh, your book yeah, promo. That's right. <laughs> yeah, and uh, this is the this is a a collection. It, it more co more um, contemporarily translated. It's been a something that's not necessarily been widely available. But uh, there's a great series called the Popular Patristic series. You can get so many great early documents that have been translated into English. And some of them actually have the English and uh, the original Greek side by side, if you're into mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Uh, but the Testament of the Lord is uh, a, a essentially a collection of daily prayers, daily offices, uh, liturgical services, points for, uh, you know, who, what, what are the characteristics of someone you're going to ordain to be a deacon, to be a priest, to be a bishop, you know, leadership, how, we're, what are we going to approach when it comes to the lifestyle of someone in leadership? What do we expect for them to do? So a lot of instruction in regards to the way the church was going to function. Uh, and, right. and you can find this codified in, by the early second century, um, uh, you know, into the third century, they're they're really compiling these things. But you know, those are our earliest documents right. would be available then, so, and it's very possible that some of these, especially uh, one of the one of the most well known ones, of course, is the Didache, and and you could you could possibly date it near the, the end of the first century. Uh, but the Testament of the Lord would be closely related to the Didache, although the Didache uh, lays out more of the the kind of the theory of the Christian way, you know, the first six chapters, I think it's the first six chapters, the first half of it basically is on what is the way of darkness and what's the way of light and how do we understand those things. The Testament of the Lord is much more a practical, this is what the community is going to look like. So in, in some of the daily prayers and the daily offices, one of them, uh, one daily praise they have, this is the prayer to be said, these are the things that you're going to go through. Uh, and in, in there's one line in the middle of, they got this long prayer that the, the priest is going to say and the people are going to respond, that kind of thing. And then there's this one line that says, now is the time for any prophetic utterances to be given, and those that are prophesied will be rewarded. Uh -huh. um, you know, there'll be a reward for them, uh, you know, ostensibly so, a heavenly reward. So if the Anglican Church were to make a change, they could change their liturgy in their prayer book to add space for prophetic utterances. Is that right, Father Ron? <laughs> what would that <laughs> process look like? <laughs> I'm sure we could. Uh, I don't know if it will happen. Uh, we can always we can always pray. But you know, Josh, one of the interesting things is is that uh, we, of course, you you you're going to talk about Saint Gregory the Great's homilies there. But it seems like in in the er, in these early documents, uh, prophecy and, and the exercise of prophetic ministry is is more assumed than it is described. Am I right in yes. saying that? Yeah, absolutely right in saying that. It it is. There's you can't you can't find a lot. I I haven't been able to anyway. So in my study, I haven't been able to find a lot of uh, a lot of documentation that talks about how to prophesy. You know, in, in mm -hmm. juxtaposing that, of course, to today, we've got a lot of. Perf this is how you prophesy. There's books about right. that. There's no basics to that. prophetic ministry or prophetic activation no. books like that. I, I and I don't have. It's not like I have a problem with that. It doesn't mean that right, again right. the early church just because they didn't do it in in the same way we do it today doesn't mean it's right or wrong. Right, right, uh, right. But you do you. It is it is assumed, and there's given a lot of room for it to be functioning within uh, the church environment. And mm -hmm. uh, in 
you know, the first few centuries on. And uh, uh, so, yes, absolutely. There is an assumption that it's going to be functioning. And you see that in, uh, in the documents, like in the Testament of the Lord, when they say here in this daily praise, here is the, the spa, the pause buffer where we would allow for prophetic ministry you know, in the, in the church context I grew up in, that was usually between worship and before the announcements. <laughs> Yeah, there was a yeah, pause yeah. buffer, right? We had no. that's, everyone's that's, got all the soaky, lovey Jesus thing. We're ready for the, for the, word of the Lord. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's this is the time that we kind of expect it to happen, and mm-hmm. so there's some churches that practice a semblance of that. And I know some, you know, in the Anglican uh, in the Anglican world, I know some Anglican priests that would give room for that. Um, you know, that would partly be dependent upon the priest and the parish as well. I would I would assume that uh, that's the case, Father Ron. No, that's correct. Uh, certainly, especially uh, in the 1960s and, and after, uh, when the charismatic movement uh, moved into uh, the mainline churches, uh, especially the Roman Catholic Church uh, and, and the Episcopal Church, you would have clergy who had been touched uh, by the Holy Spirit through that movement who would try to, uh, they wouldn't do away with the liturgy completely, but they would try and make more room and more space uh, for the Holy Spirit to uh, operate among the congregation in the gifts. That's right. Right. In in the Testament of the Lord, there's one space where it talks about what to do when uh, someone that is... Uh, someone that hasn't been to the church before is visiting. They don't necessarily call them a new believer, but someone who's come that they're not, they don't, they don't know who they are. Uh, and there's a space given where they're to be introduced to the priest of the congregation and to basically sit down and have a meal. And the, and the priest in the, in the instructions about how they're going to deal with this is given, um, is given specific instruction to prophesy over the person in order to stir them on towards a holy lifestyle, a holy, uh, to living in a holy way. Uh, so very specific instructions. And when you meet a new person coming into the church, he should meet with the priest, the priest should prophesy over him. The word for prop, the word prophecy is specifically used there. Okay. Okay. How else, I guess I'm, I'm curious Did that look like in, in the, in the liturgy in the early church, was that, I mean, was everyone, was it just kind of whoever, whoever can kind of come up and grab the mic? And I mean, you, you spoke to this too, but, um, no, you've, you've, uh, you mentioned in, uh, um, how were, you know, there was a special role of widows, you know, <laughs> that, um, the yeah. testament of the Lord talks about. So just tell us more about what that would look like. Yeah. In, in the testament of the Lord, there's a, there's a section where it talks about how we approach widows and, and, you know, we have to, of course, think about that in today's, through the lens of today, how do we apply that? Because a, a widow was a much more common thing to experience mm-hmm. in that time. I mean, the life expectancy, especially of men that were going off to fight wars and things like that, it, the life expectancy was much shorter. And so the, having to deal with widows was much more, I mean, we do have to deal with it today. I'm not, I'm not disparaging that in the least. Right, it's just right. life expectancy is so much longer today. So, you know, they're, they're dealing specifically with widows because widows are people that have been put into a situation where they can't, they need to be cared for. And so mm-hmm. principally we can look at that and just, you know, making, making sure we understand that first, that this doesn't just apply to widows in the first century. This applies to people that are in places of need that also have come alongside and served the church in a way that um, uh, they've demonstrated their lifestyle to people. So That's there's good. these widows are uh, almost a special class of people that are often mentioned in the liturgical documents uh, in the Testament of the Lord. In another one um, uh, here on the apostolic tradition talks about how to uh, deal with widows as well. Where is that one? Hippolytus puts this together. I don't know if you can see that, mm-hmm. but... Right, uh, on right. the aposto- yeah, on the apostolic tradition, um, and and so they talk about how to deal with widows because widows were very much integral to the community. Were serving in the community, and and of course we even see this in the New Testament, um, mm-hmm. where this this is talked about a couple of times. So the the specific, there were specific requirements when it came to a widow. What you should look at as their lifestyle, uh, the mm-hmm. way they carried themselves, uh, the character and integrity they walked right. in, the service they had, and actually one of the statements when it comes to how how we approach which widows should be selected to be functioning within the church community or, uh, or to invest some 
level of responsibility to one of the statements that's made about them is we should consider anything that's been revealed by God through the saints about that widow. Um, that's one, almost a word for word verbatim statement. Um, uh, the saints being of course the, the, this isn't the, the cult of the saints that, uh, you know, arose as they would later develop. Saints. Mm-hmm. Yes, would later develop. Yeah, this is just mm-hmm, the mm-hmm. people that were walking in holy lifestyle in the community. So right. I'm going to make a distinction right. between those things. Right. But, but they were so, still yeah, they were still they were still older lady intercessors. You know. Yeah, they were older um, lady intercessors. Absolutely. Yeah. It, yeah. Any any church I go to, any denomination I've been in, I I find the women fifty sixty plus that are. Fasting and praying <laughs> for the church, yeah, that married, absolutely. Or married uh, or um, uh, married or widowed, but um, it's just yeah. it was really cool to me to see that. And they're in from the testament of the Lord, weren't they involved somehow in that prophetic, like praying for the prophetic ministry in some way? What what did that look like? Yeah, yeah. They the widows that were that were set aside for service who had demonstrated their it, really they wanted to make sure they were dedicated to the community and so they're looking for mm-hmm. that kind of commitment um at, and one of the in the um uh, on the two ways this is one of them one of the great books talks about that in here um it talks about how and and one of the things what well i'll say what they said and then a side note to that because this was something we talked about um that uh, uh father ron had had brought up is in in on the two ways the there's a specific section that's set aside as uh, three widows that would be appointed for different service within the community and of the three two of them were to be set aside and it specifically says that two were to continue in prayer for all or who are in temptation and for revelations concerning whatever is necessary yeah, so that was their specific role. This is this is yeah. the like you said, this is the intercessory, right. um, the intercessory team at a church. I mean, our, right. the church that I serve in, we have a team of four or five uh, women that come together, uh, like all the time to pray and intercede for the needs right. of the church. And so they're asking God strengthen those in temptation, and God, if you've got something to say to us prophetically today, come and speak it during this. Yeah, absolutely. Service. Yep. That's awesome. Yeah. And, and the way, you know, in case some people want to get into some of these documents, um, the way that some of them are characterized, maybe, Ron, you had mentioned this, so maybe you could speak to this too, is uh, the statement about the widows is characterized as being given by Peter. Um, and a lot, of the, a lot of the early documents will, will look like, they'll be, they'll be characterized as the apostles have spoken this to us. And, and we're... You know, they weren't necessarily looking at them as saying the apostles directly said this, but this is in line with the type of teaching that's been handed down that we should do within our community. And the Didache is is literally called the teaching of the apostles, and it's styled as what they what was gleaned from the life of the apostles for the community. And so, you know, when you start reading some of this stuff, it could be confusing to someone who reads it and goes, "Oh, did Peter actually say this? Did James actually say this? Did Matthew actually say this?" Um, and I, I mean, I think the answer is is quite squarely that they most likely did not say those things, uh, but maybe they're in line with what was maybe an oral tradition, mm-hmm. maybe something mm-hmm. that uh-huh. was that it, not a word for word verbatim. This is what Peter right. told us, and so, so we have to understand. So right. That. So these so some of these documents are making direct references to here's what the apostles told us, and we're we're passing it down. Now we don't have those. What you're saying is we don't have those statements in scripture to verify or any other documents but what's possibly going on there is they've they're they're handing down some maybe either some oral traditions or some ideas that were conveyed um that were handed down from one generation to another is that is that right yeah 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 Yeah. Yeah. i I think yeah um some of these documents if you know if we accept a fairly early dating for Mm -hmm. them uh, date from the time that the New Testament canon was still sort of being uh, com- compiled, if you will. Uh, you know, the, obviously the, the the books were all written at that time, uh, mm-hmm. but the but the idea that at all times and in all places the New Testament canon was was fixed and uniform all the way around that that didn't happen uh, until a bit later, and I think that the the early church sort of had this understanding of two things. Number one was that uh, they and 
Christians in all generations were the inheritors of Jesus' promise that the Holy Spirit would continue to guide you into the truth. And number right. two, it was always, uh, you know, the, the, the touchstone of how they judged teaching was, is this, uh, is this in line with the teaching of the apostles, right? Okay. And there was yeah. a point, you know, that early, early, early on, you couldn't necessarily go to a particular writing to say, okay, this is square with the apostles' teaching. So I think, Matthew, you right. actually use the word oral tradition. And of course, since the Reformation, that's been a big point of contention. Uh, but right. back then, it, it, it wasn't a point of contention at all. Uh, the idea that tradition with a capital T, that which is handed down, had its right, written right. form in the scriptures, and also that which just lived in the memory of the community as a whole. Does that make right, sense? Right, yeah. Right. Yeah, the reformers were seemed real concerned with oral tradition because they saw some of these, quote, oral traditions that seemed not only not in Scripture at times, but contrary to the teaching of the Scripture. So that's what, I think, just to situate just the difference between, you know, that first few centuries after the Apostles versus Reformation. We've had 1,500 years go by, and they're looking at some oral traditions and saying, I don't see this in the Scriptures anywhere, and this is, so we're going to challenge these things. Is that fair to say? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm, okay. Yeah, and and it bears it's it's important to say that as well because again we're not mm -hmm. we don't read the 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 early documents and go okay well this is akin to gospel we read them to see right. how they practice the gospel and how they were employing that in their daily lives and seeing okay well is this functioning and do we see it continuing to function and is it given room and mm -hmm. space and yes we see that that's the case now uh, with that said also. Um, it it's also not it, it bears it bears saying that it's not like everything was perfect. Yeah. Um, so there, and, were you know, once, <laughs> there were problems. There were problems. There were prophetic yes. problems. <laughs> yeah, and in every in every sphere, right? You've got mm -hmm. these. Having studied the Desert Fathers quite a bit, um, there was you know, so one of the one of the you know as a side note to that, one of the great examples in the Desert Fathers is Saint Simeon, uh, the Stylite. And mm -hmm. Simeon was, I mean, he was a mess in his younger years. He was not respected by the fathers in his younger years because of how he practiced his life. And so you've got, and they were afraid of his example, actually kicked him out of multiple communities because they were afraid of his example. This is the guy that made it popular to dwell on the top of a pillar, uh, which was the normal thing he did. All the other stuff was a little so more. So he, he went uh, and basically chained himself to the top of a pillar, right? And just didn't come back down. Yeah, he did. Well, at, fir at first... <laughs> The first thing he did was tie a rope around his uh, midsection uh, and let it chafe away and wear away at his skin and not let anybody know it for days and days until it ate away and was buried in his skin. And as, a, as you wow. know, some way of, of paying atonement or something like that, you know, yeah. suffering. And then when the fathers found out about it, they kicked him out of the community. They said, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. And the next thing you knew, mm -hmm. he chained himself on top of a mountain. And when they found out that he had done that, um, they re soundly rebuked him again. And uh, then when he chained himself on top of the pillar, um, which he did, he actually chained his feet so that he couldn't even sit. Um, and he was stuck in the same position. The, the way that they tested whether or not he'd learned his lesson was to ask him to come down. And they, they, they counsel, they send this, this, this is completely, well, it's related, but, um, you know, I just. <laughs> this I've brings up a whole other course. host of issues. Yeah, too. it does. <laughs> the, way, the way they tested whether Simeon was being led from God, led of God was, we're going to send a delegation to him and say, come down, the fathers want to speak with you. And if Simeon says, no, I'm busy, then, then we know that he's not following God. But if he comes down immediately, then tell him, stay up there. Because of your humility and your obedience, we recognize that what you're doing is of the Lord. Uh, and so he does. He, come, he, he immediately begins to come down, climb down his pillar, and they say, no, 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 actually stay up there. It's just a test from the fathers. Stay up there. Mm -hmm. um, we think this is of God because of your willingness to submit and obey. Um, oh, wow. So, 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 I, so that's, that's an example of problems right. that had to be worked out um, yeah. in, in, the, in the sense of the spiritual lives. But uh, there's one great quote by Isaac the Syrian, who's kind of a later monastic figure in the 7th century, where he's basically summing up um, a number of the problems that they'd seen. And he's, he's kind of saying, is it, what's more important? Is it more important to see and work great miracles, see the dead raised, see people healed, this kind of stuff, 
or is it more important to deal with um, the daily rhythm of encountering God? Um, you know, that might be my language. That's not his language, but that's essentially the two things he's juxtaposing. Right, and, right. Uh, although he does talk about the, you know, the miracles and the raising from the dead, that is his language. And, and he says, well, we've seen so many that have been able to do that and have been a blessing to many people that eventually, because they never dealt with their own heart, they fall. And in their fall, they actually hurt more people than they helped. And so we have to understand that dealing with the heart is more important than being able to work, more, work great miracles. Uh, mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. in the fall, you damage more than you actually benefited in the gift. Right, and, right. And so he's using a broad example. He's, not, he's, he's saying, we've seen this happen over and over and over again. Right. Uh, I think this is where, is it, a, I've got the quote here. I think some of it's worth reading. Is it okay if I yeah, read go a for couple it. Go lines for here? It. Just to, so he's, um, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but he, he's talking about these gifted, prophetic, or miracle-working people. He said that they, they worked great miracles and by their efforts led many to the knowledge of God. Um, so they're operating in the prophetic. They're leading many people to the Lord through their miraculous gifts. Later, however, those who gave life to others fell into base passions and put themselves to death. And they scandalized many when, from their daily behavior, again, that emphasis on behavior um, and character, yep. their actions became known. This happened because they took no care for the health of their own souls, which were sick, but instead cast themselves into the sea of the world in order to heal the souls of others while they themselves were still ailing. And so I just think that's so interesting that they... These were truly gifted people. There was a, there was a, we use, in the charismatic world, we use the term anointing. These were actually anointed yeah. people, but it didn't necessarily mean that their character was right. And that just, you know, I've, I've seen over the years, a common assumption is that for someone to be a true prophet or to have a true gift of prophecy, um, that, you know, they're never going to fall away. And if they do, it shows that, you know, their, their prophetic gift was inaccurate. And what Isaac seems to be saying is, no, there were, there were legitimate gifts there. There were legitimate miracles being performed. There was a legitimate, quote, anointing. But the real issue is, and the thing we want to look at is, is their heart. They were, they were so yeah. focused on, maybe on the platform, on getting some, something fulfillment from helping others, but they didn't care for their own souls, and then they fell, um, yeah. which caused a lot and, more damage. You know. Yeah, and, and Gregory, uh, kind, he deals with this in a way in the mm-hmm. homilies when he talks about... Uh, the nature, the difference between a true and a false prophet, and his, mm-hmm. you know, this is where you would expect it in some of our contemporary conversations, right? Where you'd expect him to say, "Well, they were accurate or inaccurate," um, mm-hmm. and that's not what he says. What he says is the way that we understand the difference between a true and a false prophet is a false prophet continues in his falsity. A true prophet, when he recognizes that he's wrong, repents and quickly corrects the error. And his example, one of the one of the most straightforward examples he gives is Nathan's words to David when David says he wants to build the Lord, the Lord a house, and David and Nathan says to David, um, uh, "Go and do all that was within your heart, for the Lord your God is with you." And then that night, the Lord appears to him and says, "Actually, no, Nathan, David's not going to build this temple, but his son's mm-hmm. going to build this mm-hmm. temple, and I'm going to build a house for David." And you know, he gives this great prophecy that, of course, is becomes you know central to uh, understanding the coming of Christ. And, and so he hinges the understanding of the true and the false on Nathan's willingness to go to David the very next day and say, David, you're not going to build this. This is what the Lord's saying about this. And the, and the reason why Nathan was wrong is because, you know, he had to put that last sentence in there. <laughs> go, go and do all that was within your heart, for the Lord your God is with you. <laughs> oh, wow. And, yeah, yeah. So Josh, so he, you, got your, you got your blessing prophecy. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> So this uh, kind of leads into uh, my next question, uh, which is, when you talk about words of prophecy today, or, or, or people ministering in the prophetic, the question that comes into my mind is, okay, how do you discern w- what is from the Lord and what isn't? Um, I mean, one way to look at that would be to say, okay, well, does it come to pass or does it not come to pass? But then we get into the idea that prophecy is uh, not just about prediction. It's not just about saying something's going to happen or something isn't going to happen. Prophecy really is, is just speaking in the spirit, a word from God. Uh, how did the early church discern uh, true prophecy from false prophecy? 
Yeah, I mean, that's a great question and, and super pertinent today as well. And, and partly there is the element of did it come to pass or not? I'm, I'm just off the cuff thinking of, uh, and Matthew, maybe you know more about this reference than I do. Um, Augustine, in one of his letters, writes about a dream that he had where um, mm -hmm. uh, Prof Profuterus and, and some other guy... There was two. I know. I well, I, well, I can't forget the name. Something Uterus or Elinus yeah, or you know, yeah, something like that. Where he has a dream where these two these two guys come to him in the dream. They've they've deceased members of his community, prophesying what's going to happen, and he basically mm. says, and and I knew this dream was from God eventually because the stuff that they said came to pass. Um, right. And so there is that there is that element right. of is it does it come to pass or does it not come to pass. Right. Um, but that's not really the thread that you see when it comes to the probably your three key texts for dealing with how do we how do we how do we um, how do we approach the issue of okay we've got these people that are prophesying consistently and regularly and and they're traveling and they're coming and they're doing this they're doing this stuff so how do we understand that and the three main texts you're going to see that. Uh, deal with this pretty uh, effectively are the Didache, the Shepherd of Hermas, and the Constitution of the Holy Apostles, uh, mm -hmm. and especially the Didache and the Shepherd. Um, and the Didache you get in chapters 11 to 13, really dealing with the issue of um, the issue of the uh, of how to deal with traveling prophets, and and then in the Shepherd it's. Um, I can't remember. I've, I've got the reference somewhere. I'll find it as we're going through this. Mm -hmm. And in the Constitution, it's Book Eight, and the Constitution deals the first part of Book Eight, and the Constitution deals with uh, uh, dealing with the issue of giftedness. And um, so, what what they really say is not so much. To, let's look and see if they're accurate, but let's look at the. Well, I mean, very directly, both the Didache and the Shepherd say, "By their life, you will know whether they're true or false." Uh, the Didache says that absolutely directly, and the Shepherd says that a number of times in different ways. But by their lifestyle, you will know whether they are a true or false prophet. And then they give a number of tests for what is the what are the points of the lifestyle that we want to see. And one of the first things the Didache says, uh, well, one of the first things the Didache says about uh, apostles and prophets specifically, he, the the Didache actually treats the apostles and prophets almost interchangeably, um, is. Uh, when they come to you, they should be received. Yeah, that's that's the well, the first thing that Didache says about apostles and prophets. Every it says the very first line in chapter eleven. Every apostle who comes to you should be received as the Lord. And and then they says and then it says um, and if he if he asks money from you, then he should be considered a false prophet. And so that term apostle and prophet is interchangeable in those first couple of sentences in chapter eleven of the Didache. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, but that's one of the first tests as they look at is how do they approach the issue of money? And that seems mm -hmm. to be a critique on the general, um, the kind of the, the cultural experience that they had with rhetoricians and philosophers and, and N.T. Wright does some commenting on this in his, uh, uh the Bible for everyone series, uh, where he talks about the, the, you had lots of people coming and setting up shop as a teacher in an area to garner support from people. And they were, they wanted you to fund their endeavors. And mm -hmm. so it seems like the Didache is commenting on the cultural practice of that and also giving some guidelines for how we should expect these people that are uh, traveling itinerates for lack of a better term, uh, how we should expect those to be functioning. And, and in fact, um, the, uh, uh, just looking back at some of my notes, um, the in the Testament of the Lord, there's some there's some requirements laid out for when you see a bishop or a priest traveling from parish to parish, ministering in parish to parish, that they should be led of the Lord in everything that they do, uh, and that it should be mm -hmm. revealed to them where they're to go and what they're to say. And so there's there's some similar language as it pertains right. to some of the bishops and priests that were responsible for broader area of people uh as as you so see it's almost the, as if it was uh, so there's almost like an expectation that your normal church minister would hear from the lord on where to minister as far as those that traveled around yes yeah absolutely mm -hmm. absolutely mm -hmm. awesome and mm -hmm. and they weren't they weren't going to come to you and ask you for money that was the first thing that they said this if they, if they make it about money then you've got you know there's a problem here mm. and, and you know, the that's lord a great give me 
Give me, yes, exactly. Give me your, give me your I, inheritance. Give me five hundred dollars. That shepherd. says the Lord. The Lord will be with you. <laughs> and, if, and if I could just uh, hop in here and remind everybody yeah. to. Uh, you know, become a, a subscriber on Patreon uh, and support the work of the Remnant Radio uh, with your with your financial support. That would be great. <laughs> <laughs> and, We're not saying thus says and, the Lord. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Because the, the shepherd, the shepherd of Hermas, the the you know the shepherd of Hermas is a, a recounting of the shepherd having uh, a number of conversations with an angel that's sent to him. Uh, recounted through it's kind of in a, in a way it reminds me of um uh pilgrim's progress you know something along those mm-hmm. lines um and but in the shepherd it literally says and if anybody by the spirit says give me money then they are a false prophet literally says that wow. <laughs> <laughs> so ron ron you're you are you didn't say by the spirit give us money so you know you're no. in the clear <laughs> Thank yeah, God. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> We're not um, getting paid for this. This makes everyone feel better. <laughs> so, yeah, there, that's right. So, yeah. There is an interesting point, though, um, and I don't think it made it into our notes for the discussion, but in the Didache, uh, it, it sort of distinguishes between apostles, prophets, teachers who are itinerant and travel, and those who settle and stay in a church community. Uh and if I'm reading it right, Josh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but, but the Didache does say that if a, if a prophet comes or a true prophet comes and settles among you, then they are entitled uh, to support yes. in the exercise of their ministry. Yes, mm-hmm. absolutely. Mm-hmm. It does say that. Yes, it does. That's it good. says That's if good. they come and they're going to settle among you, then you should support them. Yes. And it mm-hmm. also says that if you don't have a prophet... Um, and, and I think I actually have, yes, yeah, so this is a quote right here, and I think this is in chapter 13. It says, Appoint for yourselves then bishops and deacons who are worthy of the Lord, men who are unassuming and not greedy, who are honest and have been proved, for they also are performing for you the task of the prophets and the teachers. And so it's not even, that, you know, because sometimes it gets into, uh, well, this is our, the prophet in the house. This is, we need to have a house prophet come in and spe- speak this, or we need to have the prophetic ministry, right? And, um, and so I see that sometimes there's this glorification that happens when it comes to this role of prophetic ministry. And right here at the Didache, they're saying, look, if you don't have prophets and teachers, it's okay. You've got bishops and deacons that will do the same thing. And mm-hmm. um, so there is, that, there is that reverence saying, if they come and they settle among you, you should support them, but you don't need them to settle among you. Don't rely upon them. Uh, because you have the leaders appointed among you who will do the same things for you. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. The, the, one of the things that Didache says about uh, prophets, uh, and this is a direct quote, says, not everyone who speaks forth in the spirit is a prophet, but only if he has the kind of behavior which the Lord approves. From his befa- behavior, then, will the false prophet and the true prophet be known. Hmm. Hmm. I like that one. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Uh, another another one of the, uh, the the simple tests that they give in the Didache is uh, is this summed up in the in this quote: Every prophet who teaches the truth but does not do the things he teaches is a false prophet. Mm. <laughs> so practice what you preach. Right, right, right. Yeah, that's that's he can't tell you to do a bunch of stuff and then not be not do the same thing himself. Mm-hmm. Right. So essentially, he can say, "Be generous, be live live a life of um, of." humility and and uh you know debase yourselves whatever right like you'd hear commonly in in early preaching and and then turn around and live a life of luxury and glean money from all the people that um he's leading and um go out and and rent the ritzy apartment in new york city or whatever right Mm -hmm. um and they say you can't if he's if he's telling you to do one thing but he's practicing another one then don't listen to him and it's as simple as it's not go out and kill him it's just don't listen to them they're not, it's mm-hmm. not they're, what they have to share with you is not something that's v- worth valuing and paying attention to. And that's why it's important that the, one of the last utter, or one of the last instructions the Didache gives about dealing with uh, prophets is if you don't have one, it's okay because you've got bishops and deacons to do the same thing. And, mm-hmm. um, and so it's, I love the flow of how the Didache addresses these things. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, it, and the shepherd. And some of the stuff that I've quoted too from uh, this book on the on the two ways, um, Saint Vladimir's Pre- Press is where you can find all these books. It's um, I love all these things, and on the Apostolic Tradition by Hippolytus and the Testament of the Lord too. Um, 
Yeah, uh, there's a lot of they take a lot of the statements from the Didache and, you know, they're because of the oral tradition, they're restated and you might find them said in different ways and uh, things like that. But it, it's it's there's a lot of cross pollination between all of those documents. And the mm -hmm. Didache is probably mm -hmm. one of the original supporting documents for those other ones. Uh, right. But they but they've dovetailed in and added other things in there. Right. So, and, so to be clear here, what we're seeing from these documents is that we had both an incorporation of the prophetic in local communities within their within their regular liturgical services. Yeah. So it was very local, but you also had these itinerant prophets or apostles that would come through, and there was a certain protocol for how to host them, how to be hospitable to them, yet also how to kind of how to how to test and evaluate, and um and when to um. When to kind of cut the cord, say, okay, you're, you know, yeah. <laughs> you've been in town long enough, buddy, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. uh, yeah, there, the, absolutely. That's a great way of saying mm -hmm. that. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the, one of the last things the shepherd says about false prophets is don't fear a false, don't fear a prophet. Um, especially when he says, don't fear a false prophet, because their words are like a little pebble that you throw up into the, into the air. And when it hits you on the head, it doesn't hurt you at all. And right. uh, that's, you know, I'm kind of paraphrasing the picture, but that's the, that's the picture language that um, the shepherd is given is a false prophet's words aren't powerful. So don't worry about them and mm -hmm. they'll hurt you like a little pebble falling. Right. That's interesting here that, and I mean, it could be the concern of the time and the situation, but you don't, you don't seem to see a big emphasis on, I, I like the point you highlighted. You said they, the point of these is just to, you just don't listen to them. You know, you just turn them off, <laughs> you know, that it wasn't yeah. like a big making a big deal out of it, of calling out a person publicly necessarily. Um, at least that's not the concern in these particular documents. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. You know, wh one of the things that strikes me is kind of all across the board, and, and you've been touching on this, is the importance of holiness of life, uh, character, the, the character of Christ. Uh, within the the life of of the prophet or the the believer, um, and I think that that that's instructive uh, for us today, especially in circles where the gifts of the spirit uh, are are the charismatic gifts are still held to be in operation and important. Uh, I know when I first got involved in the charismatic renewal, there was a bit of tension uh, between some who seemed to want the spectacular manifestations of the gifts and that was the only display of the spirit that they would accept that the spirit was was alive in the community it was almost like the 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 gifts were ends uh, unto themselves uh, whereas it seems like the early church uh, w the the gifts are in operation the gift of prophecy is in operation there's prophets there's apostles but there's also just your <laughs> everyday ordinary bishops and and priests and deacons but, but the point is everyone needs to be going in the same direction, which is towards greater holiness, uh, greater conformity yeah. of character with the character of Christ. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a great, that leads into a great point about what, what the shepherd lays out, the distinction between the true and the false practice of prophetic ministry. And, and the, I mean, the first thing that the, in the shepherd of Hermas, what the angel says to the shepherd, again, characterized as, um, oh, yeah, that's right. I've got, you can find the shepherd in this book, The Apostolic <laughs> Bondage, as translated by Jack Sparks. That's a, this, the Didache and uh, the shepherd are both in this, as well as a bunch of other letters from um, the early ones. One of, one of Ignatius of Antioch's prophetic declarations to his church is found in there as well in one of his letters. Oh, wow. Um, and uh, that's a fun one where he says he's, the, the, the voice of the Lord cried out from him, and not his voice, but the Lord's voice. Uh, proclaiming by the Spirit. So anyway, um, in the shepherd, the very first thing that it starts off is the shepherd of Hermas asks this angel who's visited him, how, how can I know the difference between a true and a false prophet? And the angel says, mm -hmm. um, hear about both prophets, is quoting it. And in the manner that I'm going to tell you, you can test the prophet and the false prophet. By his life, you test the man that has the divine spirit. And so then the angel goes on to give you know, I, I'll, I'll, I'll quote um, the, the, the statements that he makes because they're quite short, um, just in the ability to sum them up. The, there's, the chapter itself is longer, um, uh, so he elaborates on these things. But these are, the, these are basically the juxtaposed with each other, right next to each other, the, the tests of a true prophet and a false prophet. 
um, the the qualifications of the prophet that should be listened to, and you could probably compare this with First uh, Timothy three and a number of other lists in Scripture of what holiness and righteousness look like uh, as practiced in an individual because they're very similar. Um, he says this. The angel says, the one who has the spirit from above, speaking about the true prophet, the one who has the spirit from above is gentle and quiet and humble. That's the first thing. Uh, the next statement he makes is, he refrains from all evil and worthless desires of this age. Uh, the next statement he makes about the true prophet is, he makes himself more needy than all other men. Uh, the next statement he gives is, when asked, he gives no answer to anyone. He's not, he doesn't let people put a demand on him. Um, as, and that's juxtaposed against the false prophet, which you'll see how he compares the two in a second. Uh, mm -hmm. He's not manipulated to prophecy. He doesn't get prophesy right. because someone gives him something or promises something. He, he only mm -hmm. is moved by the movement of the divine spirit, uh, being the Holy Spirit. Uh, he says, neither he speaks by himself, nor does the Holy Spirit speak whenever a man wishes to speak, but he speaks when God wishes him to speak. Um, uh, and then, uh, so then he goes on and he says, when the, when it's very practical, when, uh, whenever the man who has the divine spirit comes into an assembly of righteous men who have faith in the divine spirit and a prayer is made to God by the assembly of those men, then the angel of the prophetic spirit, which is assigned to him, fills the man. And that man, having been filled by the Holy Spirit, speaks to the group as the Lord wills. So in this way, the divine spirit is known. And so he was only moved when the Holy Spirit moves upon him. Um, and you know, I, we could probably do a whole other episode talking about that interesting statement he makes that the angel of mm -hmm. the prophetic spirit comes to him. But you know, there's a number of different ways that can be interpreted, and people have commented uh, differently about that. Um, mm -hmm. That's an interesting language. But then he juxtaposes that with the characteristics of a false prophet, which is uh, the man who thinks he has the spirit elevates himself. Uh, you know, juxtaposed mm -hmm. against quiet and humble, uh, mm -hmm. and. Uh, quiet, humble, Same. and uh, gentle. And so, so that's saying he elevates himself and uh, he wishes to have the seat of honor. So, right. you know, I need to be front and center, you know. Right. Uh, he wants to be important. He wants people to know that yes. he's anointed. Yes. Yeah. Or he gifted. or she. Mm -hmm. He or yeah. she. And yeah. um, as opposed to the humble, quiet man who, yeah. or woman. Yeah. He's, he's bold and shameless mm -hmm. and talkative. You know, juxtaposed with someone who's quiet, he talks a lot. He fills up empty words. And um, in, in, in given this and in juxtaposing them, you could probably say that the false prophet would be someone who is very divisive in his language, hmm. uh, lives in great luxury and in many other pleasures. Uh, and here's a great one. <laughs> Accepts pay for his prophesying. You know, there's just a side note. This is my personal recommendation. Um, there's a video that um, R.T. Kendall, for those of you who know R.T. Kendall, did. I love R.T. Kendall. Um, mm -hmm. He did it a couple of years ago called Prophetic Accountability, or Prophetic Responsibility, sorry. Prophetic Responsibility, mm -hmm. where he talked about some of the problems in prophetic ministry. Um, he probably put that out three or four years ago. It's a fantastic teaching. Um, uh, and anyway, he deals with he, he He talks about this kind of stuff specifically, but that's a side note. This video that really impacted me. So he accepts mm -hmm. pay for his prophesying, and if he does not receive, he does not prophesy. And that, you know, mm -hmm. that stuff happens today. It's, it's, this is not a, um, this is not like, a, oh, that was something that happened only when the early church was right. functioning. This is something that happens today, and it's a, it is, the financial issue is a real problem that we need to deal with, and mm -hmm. any, anybody that's worth their salt when it comes to prophetic ministry will address these kind of things, um, whether right, it's in right. the bylaws of their organization, whether it's in the documentation they put out, whether it's in the courses they talk about, whether it's in the people that they have, you know, thinking even about, um, you know, I won't even go there, but they got people around them holding them accountable to that. Uh, I was just right. listening to a guy. No, won't go there either. Um, well, I have a, I have a question because, you know, <laughs> you pointed out earlier that, uh, that there was a difference between a prophetic minister that was, prophesying, give me money, um, versus, you know, other statements and protocol that were saying, hey, if a prophetic person comes in, you know, take care of them, be hospital, hospitable to them, make sure you take care of their needs. So there is a distinction there. Yeah. Um, but this Shepherd of Hermas seems to be concerned about people that are standing up and saying, um, if you donate to me, I will, I will prophesy to you. Yes. Um, is, yes. That, is that kind of what's going on here? So yeah. Okay. 
Yes, that's okay. much more what's going on there. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Then he says this. Um, and if you don't donate it, to me, I won't prophesy. You know, yes, so. yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, it says, "If is it possible for a divine spirit to? This is the shepherd. Is it possible for a divine spirit to accept a salary for prophesying? <laughs> you can't. You can't say, pay me and I'll prophesy because the spirit doesn't move that way. You can't. Mm-hmm. The spirit's not moved by prophecy, or not moved right. by uh, financial gain, and and so that means the prophets move by financial gain." And that's the distinction that's made between those two things. The, mm-hmm. the that's why the characteristics of a prophet uh, that you want to listen to is one who makes himself needful and doesn't live in luxury. That's the that's following on from the Didache, you know, widely circulated mm-hmm. documents that say when they come and live among you, uh, support them because we're already looking at the fact that they're not coming among us and saying, "Give me all your money." They're coming right. among us and serving and. And again, another another one of those litmus tests in the Didache is if they tell you to do the things that they don't do, then don't listen to them. Mm-hmm. So when when we recognize the true prophet who comes into our midst, and and that's the person we want to support, is they wouldn't even have talked about the need for money or that you should give them or you know they, you can put your needs out there. Of course, I'm not saying that, but but using the gift as a way as a way of generating your income. And tying in the operation of the gift to um, the the financial blessing that you're going to receive. I'm up. Okay, here we are. Looks like we had some uh, technical difficulty there. Do we have the other guys with us now? All right. I'm here. Are we, and we're live. Are we still live? Yes, Josh, I need you to start oh. over from the very, very beginning and just go back over all of that okay. one more time for us. Okay, so um, Ron's shirt. That's <laughs> offering for Ron's shirt. Yeah, that's right. God bless you. Um, yeah, there we go. That's right. The priestly blessing. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> We're kidding, everyone. Uh, yeah, we are kidding. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Chill. <laughs> but we're getting just about uh, towards the end of our time. So, uh, Josh, how would you kind of sort of put a put a bow on all of this that we've been talking about today? Yeah, I would say if we were going to try and take what they what they taught and how they understood. Um, weighing through these different standards, uh, I've put together a list of 10 points that I think would be helpful. Um, the point number one, if we're going to monitor, modernize the standards, again, this is Josh Hoffert's interpretation uh, as, a, as a way of contemporizing some of these things, that, that the, the safeguards they put in place um, uh, to keep the purity of uh, prophetic ministry um, front and center would be the person, we should expect people not to be concerned with building his or her own ministry. Um, uh, we, should, we should look to people that aren't concerned about making money off of what they do. Um, we should look at people that should have a desire to live in simplicity. They would, they're not living in great luxury. And I'm not saying that you can't have a, a car that is not a beater, but I'm saying is you probably don't mm-hmm. need um, you know, the Porsche Panamericana. Um, they won't use their ministry as a platform to sell you something. The outworking of this usually being something like you need this desperately and only I can give it to you. Um, they won't attempt to convince you that, that they are needed for your next great breakthrough, healing, or financial blessing. They just simply let the Lord be the Lord in the, in the moment. They'll consistently adopt a position of humility and not criticism. Humility is this, recognizing that without God, I am nothing. When insulted, responds in love. Uh, does not uh, tear others down in order to make him or her look better and is not divisive in their language. And we look at people that will teach us and help us. And uh, the truly gifted person should look to become redundant. Um, equip other people. This is the Ephesians 4 principle. They equip others for the work of ministry. Um, I, I, you know, kind of my, the, the statement I've been making personally to myself really is, I'm, I just don't really want to listen to anybody that's not going to lead me into an encounter with the Father. We're not going to teach me mm-hmm. something about the Father's heart. And so if, if, I, if I'm not being led in that way by the people I'm listening to, I'm going to tune them out. And I think that's consistent mm-hmm. with what the Didache and the Shepherd um, 
are principally trying to communicate. Awesome. Oh, awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Matthew, uh, what about you? Any final thoughts or reflections on this? Well, it, it, actually, it raises a lot more questions we don't have time <laughs> to go into today. Um, but I think, I think Josh's points were great. I think what um, final thoughts I have here is, again, I just want to reiterate, you know, within the early church, we saw the prophetic, we saw, um, we have testimony of, of prophecy of healings and miracles occurring after the time of the apostles. And um, I'm, I'm guessing a lot of folks that are listening in, you know, that's, that's why they're listening in. They, want, <laughs> they, they already believe that. But I just think that's really important to note is that, um, you know, within there, there is controversy around are these gifts still available today, very much within the evangelical world. Um, and I think we just, if we take a, a, an honest look at history, we see this was operating um, clearly in multiple, um, um, really from, from, this time period that we're discussing today up till present. But um, but also, I love how Josh Hoffert emphasized there were real problems and there was protocol that needs to be put in place. And I think today we've, we've got to look at that and say, okay, um, how can we, using scripture and using the, the principles and teaching of scripture, and then looking at how other people at different points in history have done this, what are some things, what are some lessons we can learn on how to appropriate that protocol today? Yeah, I think that uh, in a lot of ways, this kind of flows nicely into what we'll be doing next week, uh, it, because what we see just even in these documents is this tension that has been with the church, it almost seems like from the very beginning, which is uh, the, the openness to the spontaneous outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the exercise of the gifts and the sort of stabilizing influence of pastoral institutions, liturgy, the canon of scripture, creeds, all of those kinds of things. Um, and yet uh, one doesn't necessarily supersede or overcome the other, but how they live and operate together uh, to bring about a, a balanced and spirit-filled and full Christian life of discipleship is something we can learn uh, a lot from here. I think before we sign off, uh, I think we're going to have, uh, we're going to interact with some of the questions that have uh, come across in the chat. Josh Lewis, uh, do you have anything yeah, for us? Yeah, guys. So here's here's the thing. There, there were a bunch of questions that I starred up and just realized when the YouTube chat crashed and came back up we lost those questions that were being asked oh, earlier. No. So I can ask okay. them by memory. Uh, Maria mm -hmm. said, should I feel bad for uh, giving to the traveling evangelist who comes through to town? If, if or my church gives a love offering, should I, should I feel con uh, compelled to give? Should I feel convicted about giving? Uh, how should I approach that? What do you guys think? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Yeah, yeah, that is a great question. Who I'll, wants to address uh, it? Go for it. Yeah. You got I'll something give my to thoughts Go first. For that's okay. Yeah. I've been, no, that's one of the questions that important question I think is raised because you yeah. you see that commonly. You see, you know, evangelists or, or any type of minister comes in, take up a love offering for them. Um, for me, when I see that happen, I just generally, I just honestly ask the Holy Spirit. I think what's important to do is that we relieve ourselves of the pressure to say like, I I I have to be compressed or compelled to give. I mean, Scripture just teaches that. Was it Second Corinthians nine that let him who gives, gives um, cheerfully, not under compulsion. And so if there is a sense of like, either either within your own heart or from from the, the person in town is, that seems to be kind of pressuring you, um, then then I would just step back and just and, and, and just say, no, I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit what he wants me to give. Um, and, uh, um, and I can do it that way. Now, um, I don't think that that person, this is my personal opinion here, um, feel free to, to push back on it, guys. But if someone comes in and, and if there's some kind of love offering for that minister, I don't think that's a bad thing. Um, we've, we've, I've seen that happen in a number of churches, and it's an opportunity to bless them. And, and I think that there is benefit spiritually. We want to sow in and bless them um, and just and ask God to advance what they're doing. And so for me, whenever I hear that, if I was personally touched and impacted, um, by that, I re my question is, is like, God, how can I give? How can I bless this person? Um, there are times where I felt a, 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 a conviction to give a certain amount. There's times where I felt like, you know, this is, we've, you've done your giving, you know, <laughs> for a budget for the month and I'm not asking anything else of you. So I've, so I just, I kind of take it to the Lord and I take it to my wife. You know, um, we always whisper to one another and, uh, 
Um, sometimes she'll hear, she'll sense the Holy Spirit saying to give a certain amount, and I'll sense the Holy Spirit to give a certain amount. Our general rule is whoever hears higher, you know, has truly been humble and heard <laughs> yeah. the Lord. But uh, um, a couple of times <laughs> we've said, uh, let's ask again. That seems really big. But, uh, <laughs> but um, <laughs> so, um, and I think it's a principle of, of just kind of like, as we talked about, that just being hospitable, of caring for, of receiving a prophet. Um, um, scripture talks about you receive a prophet um then you receive a prophet's reward. I think there is a reward and a way to receive them is through hospitality um, and you want to bless them. But again, you just shake off and throw off all of that pressure and compulsion to do it. Yeah. Amen. That's super what, helpful. Mm -hmm. What And I'll, I'll just comment also, because what the Didache says is when the, when the prophet comes to you is they should be taken care of, not the ones that stay with you, but they, you should feed them and you should house them um, and you know, give them what they need. Uh, when they're with you. And we have to, again, look at the modernizing principle because mm -hmm. in, in our, our contemporary society, again, we're not, we don't, every house doesn't bake bread every day. Um, and so there's not necessarily, we're not full of goods. The, the common practice isn't to give a meal to the person. The common practice is to take them out to a meal. And um, right, so right. we approach those things differently. Our traded goods are largely dependent on money and not largely mm -hmm. dependent on the goods that we have in the house. And so when the prophet is, when it's counseled to take care of the prophet, and I'm not referring to the prophet that comes to live among you, the one that is supposed to be um, cared for when they come and minister, um, you know, we can look at that and say how we would probably do that today is that we'd give them the finances to cover their needs. Um, mm -hmm. And so the and again the Didache and the shepherd the only litmus test to say should we listen to this person or not is and the and it's uh, by the way the 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 um, the litmus test isn't should I give to this person or not it's should I listen to them or not um, but mm -hmm. there's a number of different tests it's not just the financial thing it's hey when they came and they spoke to you were they tearing everybody else down and building themselves up you know that's right, another indication right. it's not right. just they're just because they're a traveling itinerant person. Now we should all of a sudden be cautious. Well, we've got a lot of things we can look at. Do they carry themselves with humility? Do they make the, themselves the best things since sliced bread? You need me to pray for you. And I'm the only thing that can heal you. Do they, is this the way that they characterize themselves or are they constantly pointing you back to your source is God? Your source is the father. He's the only thing I have. He's all like, the only reason I can do this is because he's in me. So what's the disposition of the person is is you have to look at the totality of it, not just, well, they're taking a love offering in my church, because it is a good thing to bless those people who are doing the work among mm -hmm. you. Scripture is clear mm -hmm. about that, and the early documents are clear about that. And so again, right. I think Matthew's, Matthew's statement, ask the Holy Spirit, is fantastic. That's exactly what we should be doing. And I love the humility inherent in, mm -hmm. well, I'm going to give, the, between the two of you, I'll give the higher amount. And, you know, now it would be interesting and to see who usually hears the higher amount, you know. Right. As we men, if you, <laughs> men, if you men, if you can't hear the Holy Spirit, just ask your wife. <laughs> classic, classic charismatic so, platitude. Yeah. Um, when it comes to uh, there's another question, and I want to thank Jeffrey. He went back through the chat because he had them, and he started dumping the questions in here. He picked up one oh, of the great. questions oh, awesome. from by... Okay, so this is J Jeffrey, clearly Jeffrey, with, with two threes, which I think is a clever user handle. Um, he's asking a question for... Prager, I suppose. Um, did any of the early church writers single out a certain supernatural gift of the Holy Spirit as an account uh, as as not occurring any longer? Example: speaking in tongues was only uh, to authenticate the, and because he didn't have as many characters as the former guy does, he continues. Apostle's message. So uh, uh, did, did he had to put it in two different text boxes because he wanted to give the person attributing credit. So uh, anyway, so was there writings in the early church saying, hey, these giftings, these uh, what, what I think would be falsely attributed script as a category as apostolic sign gifts, were these only given to the apostles and those closely associated with the apostles and thus dying out when the apostles died out? Did, did any of the church fathers speak to something like that? I'll and let not the, everybody at once. Yeah, I'll let the other two uh, 
come weigh in on that. I know uh, in, in my own familiarity, I, I don't know of, of any example of it being that explicit. I think if there were something that explicit, then perhaps the continuist cessationist controversy today would not be quite so um, heated with its various nuanced arguments and, and things like that. I, I'm right. not aware in, of anything like that. Right. In, in, in the fourth century, you had um, Eusebius, the great church historian, he was talking about how the gifts were still in operation in various communities. And he was quoting um, earlier guys like Irenaeus of Lyon. Um, and it, the way he talks about it was suggesting that there were, there were other places in the world that were not seeing a manifestation of the gifts. Um, and so he's basically still trying to remind people, say, hey, this is still happening today. So I definitely think that just from from a statement like that, you also have Augustine of Hippo, who seemed more hesitant to embrace the gifts of the Spirit. Um, he, I'm not sure of an explicit place where he ever denied a spiritual gift, uh, um, and the gift of tongues, but he would say in sermons about the gift of tongues um, that the gifts of tongues in Acts 2 were a sign that the um, that the gospel will be taken to the languages of all the nations. And he basically says, we're, we're not speaking in tongues today, or it doesn't happen, or we don't see this happen. So he's not necessarily arguing that it's not available or it will not happen anymore, but he does seem to be acknowledging, hey, this is, I haven't seen this in my own ministry. We don't, I haven't heard any reports of seeing this. However, in later writings, he'll start to, um, he has a few of his own uh, mystical experiences, sees visions, and then has a number of um, witnesses healing miracles um, and, um, and, and, and verified prophetic um, dreams and visions that he is very explicit to make sure that those are getting reported and documented and spread among the community. Because in his mind, it's saying, we're denying God glory by not sharing these testimonies. Um, so I hope that, uh, again, I'm, I'm with Father Ron. I can't think of any place where someone is explicitly denying them. Um, but there are, there are suggestions that um, it was not as common in, in certain places across the body of Christ. Um, but again, the point was to say, no, this, is, this actually is still happening in places. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Matthew, uh, Augustine had written about healing, like you had spoken about tongues, am I right? That mm -hmm. saying like, hey, this has passed away, or we're not seeing this in our ministry. But then later in book 22 of Kingdom of God, he's like, like records the what, what seems to be hundreds of miracles, not, not in right, great detail, right, but right. speaks of them, right? One of his earlier works, I think it's on true religion. I don't remember that, I'll, I'll have to look up, but there's a passage that seems to say that he, he would believe that the gifts have ceased. Um, now, when you read Confessions, um, his, his autobiography, he talks about personally experiencing healing miracle <laughs> um, very early on in his conversion, um, and also early on in his conversion, having this, in, this being taken up into a trance-like state um, in a vision um, as his mom is passing away. Those are the only two mentions, and you just get a lot of silence about it. But yes, in the City of God, one of his massive treatises, at book 22, he is just um, one healing testimony after another. Bam, bam, bam. Here are things that he's witnessed personally and seen in his own communities. Um, so if he was a cessationist early on, if he did believe that the gifts have ceased, definitely by the end of the career, he said, nope, I've seen it happen with my eyes. Well, and the, uh, in the life of the church... Uh, as a whole, by Augustine's time, the practice of anointing with oil and laying on of hands for healing had sort of become, for lack of a better term, institutionalized uh, mm -hmm. in the liturgical and sacramental life of the church. Whether that's a good or right. bad thing, uh, you know, is up to uh, up to you. Uh, but I think it does reflect that. Uh, but even as charismatic fervor perhaps fell away. Uh, the idea that God would still move uh, for healing uh, continued on, in the, even in the regular sacramental and liturgical life of the church. Mm -hmm. There's there's a statement um, in Cassian's conferences. Uh, you know, Cassian, of course, codifying to the West the practices of the desert uh, fathers and mothers. Uh, when he records his his conversation with Nesteros. And they're talking about spiritual gifts, and and you know he's Cassian's 
kind of couching this as a com- as what Nestero said, but most people would agree that this is what Cassian said and was what he was inspired to take forward uh, later in his life as he spent time with the Egyptian monks. But he says, um, he gives basically three different reasons why gifts exist. Um, and the first one he says is, a gift exists owing to the holiness of the lifestyle of the individual. Um, and again, they, they don't really separate out the different gifts as distinct functions because to, to the early church, it's not, do I have, does they have the gift of prophecy or word of knowledge or wisdom or faith or healing or miracles? It's just when someone is consistently living in this way where they're, me- they're connected with the heart of God, they're walking in a place of humility and love and tenderness, and we can see the holiness in their life, these things happen because the Holy Spirit's present within them. And that's mm-hmm. much more the, the, the way that it's characterized in the practical literature, at least conter- concerning uh, the monastic uh, uh, thread of that. And so, so he says, you can, the gifts, the, there's gifts because of the holiness of lifestyle. But then the second one, Estero says, or Cassian says, is the gifts come because of the need within the community. Um, mm-hmm. and because they're healing, someone needs healing. And so the gift is there not because of the person that prays, but because the person who needs to receive. And so he makes that distinction between those who we see that have that holy lifestyle. And then because there's a need in the community, something happens. And we're looking at right. the fourth century at that point. And then the third one is because demons try and falsify the gifts. Um, that's the right. third one that, uh, Cassian throws out there. And so there's, there's a, a live and well, a conversation about the, 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 the things happening that, happen when the Holy Spirit comes, what we've come to expect today in, in um, charismatic type circles and, and even broader than that. But um, there's not necessarily a conversation around has this gift ce- ceased or this gift ceased. Mm-hmm. Uh, I will say it's difficult to find references, in, in my study anyway, it's been difficult to find references to tongues that are not directly related to one one language being spoken that the person doesn't understand and the other people hear and, and understand um and glossolalia uh, uh yes the the specific i'm speaking in another language but is this a heavenly language or not a heavenly language uh, i've i've been able to find a whole lot of references to um you know speaking in that angelic tongue that paul talks about in the early church fathers I know mm-hmm. uh, Orig- Origen seems to reference Kelsus arguing about that's probably the strongest case for it um, that I found. But a lot of times the interpretation of the gift of tongues and the interpretation of tongues is seen when someone gives an inspiring message in a language they don't understand that the hearers understand. And you see that, that kind of thing happening in the Desert Fathers frequently um, mm-hmm. where you know someone goes to a particular father and says... Uh, you know, give me a word, which is a common phrase, you know, teach me something. And uh, they don't speak Greek or they don't understand Latin or whatever it is. And the father then speaks in that their language when that, when everybody knows that father doesn't speak that language. So that does happen commonly. So, but we see it right in, and um, in the, in the specific stories. And then uh, per Matthew's point where you have these centralized locations where things seems to happen, eventually the characteristics that are kind of basically emphasized are the shrines of the saints and you always have crazy things recorded hagiographically that are happening in there if anything there's an increase of dramatic signs and wonders happening as it pertains to as as the this idea of the saints proliferates you see centralized locations where things are recorded as having happened all the time there's not a diminishment of that there's actually an Mm -hmm. increase of that for those locations now you can argue whether or not those are true the state the statements that are made but there's probably well one of the one of the episodes we will do later in our series is judging whether or not we can trust those miracles so we'll get to that one Mm. later yeah awesome well i think we're just about out of time uh but to all of you who have uh, joined us today well thank you so much for tuning in again if you enjoyed this content please uh, like and subscribe to the remnant radio and uh joshua hoffert matthew Esquivel, thank you guys so much this is so much fun getting together with y'all um always what a what a blessing it is uh to learn from you and to to hear from y'all so uh thank you all who have submitted questions we're sorry we couldn't get to them today uh but we will be back next tuesday at four o'clock 
uh, on Back to the Fathers here on The Remnant Radio. So uh, God bless and keep you all, and we'll see you next week.